they're off, so I may go in a little bit longer. I apologize. <laughs> uh, please I have please a go as long as you need to, Senator Cassidy. <laughs> I have a series of questions for you, Ms. Sachs. Um, um, first, the um, your testimony speaks of the need to have kind of a, a, a comprehensive arrangement between countries or blocks, if you will, if we take the EU as a block, in order to have some sort of agreement. I think I'm summarizing, although I'm sure you would find nuance there. Now, the, um, the, the reason I, I, I say this is that I have been told that the general data protection regulation of the EU risk making the EU a digital colony to the US or China. It is so restrictive that the um, big data sets that are required to enhance research on AI are almost impossible to construct. I don't know if that's true. You know far, than I, far more uh, than I do, but nonetheless, that's what I'm told. Um, so, uh, so there's something here. How do we allow those sort of data sets required for AI to be constructed, big data sets, if, that, if you agree that that is the case? And then how do we have a governance that would uh, exclude bad actors, and I think folks see China with all their cyber espionage as being a bad actor, um, but nonetheless get the fruits of this big data. And you had mentioned specifically the Japanese with the data free flow with trust paradigm. So I think I've given you kind of a lot of directions to go in your answer. Uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. I think you get at a key point here, which is that U.S. security and prosperity relies on access to large international data sets. But as with other areas of the data broker legislation that you mentioned with Ms. Gray, this one will have nuance to it. So how do we allow global data flows, but with the right safeguards in place, both at home and internationally? Um, and I think that a big important step here is making sure that we get our own house in order first. Um, the transatlantic data flow relationship will be key, and it's important that the U.S. put forward its own vision of data privacy first, but this should not be a copy and paste of GDPR. Um, I, and the, the topic of this hearing focused on antitrust, I think, gets at some of the challenges which is that one of the most important critiques of GDPR is that it may only end up serving those companies that are wealthy enough to comply with a very heavy burden that comes along with it. So it reinforces the concentration of power in big tech while, may, while there may still be limitations on, on meaningful uh, privacy protections. Um, I think that the Japanese Free, uh, data free flow with trust model is a compelling way to think about how can like-minded countries come together to put in place certain standards that would allow data to flow um, with certain conditions in place. And perhaps there can be a certification regime drawing on some of the privacy protections um, already outlined in the OECD guidelines. So there are a number of directions, and this will require nuance as well, and I look forward to helping support efforts of the committee to do that. Now, now, does that require an international treaty? I mean, you're not, a, I'm assuming you're, you may not be an international trade attorney, but can we just basically pass legislation which is in alignment with others without having a formal treaty? Or do you have a sense of how we would go about this uh, OCED kind of a collaboration? You know, I think this is one that I'm going to need to get back to you on the specific nuts and bolts of the various tools that are in place. If it's all right, I'll follow up with you and your staff after. I appreciate that. Um, now, Ms. Sachs, um, tell me, can a foreign, so we've learned that uh, the Chinese government, as an example, could purchase information on U.S. military personnel and presumably location data as well, uh, which would be kind of interesting to see where people are deployed, wouldn't it be, to see concentration of force, et cetera. Uh, what type of force, if you know from other information as to what branch of the military they were in. Uh, but do other countries have that same sort of lax attitude regarding allowing the legal purchase of information upon their security forces? So, for example, what about China? 
the Chinese government is actually moving rapidly ahead to lock down more kinds of data that are deemed vital to national security, even in the commercial sector. For example, they put in place um, a data security law um, this fall, which seeks to put, in, put forward a data classification scheme where they will move across sectors to define what kind of data would be vital to national security. They did this first in the auto sector, for example, and data deemed vital to national security has new higher bar uh, security obligations as well as um, localization requirements around who that data can be shared with. Now, I think it was you suggesting that it could be counterproductive if you wall off your data so, and that indeed, free flow of data, again, a nuance here, free flow of data is essential to ascending uh, economic power for a nation as a whole, with economic power, of course, being somewhat linked to national security. So, in your mind, is what they're doing counterproductive? I mean, is that something we should also do, or is it counterproductive? The Chinese government is shooting itself in the foot by, I think, overclassifying the kind of data that it deems vital to national security. But in theory, what they're trying to do is say certain kinds of data is vital to national security and needs to be locked down, and other kinds of data should flow and circulate in the economy. Um, now, how that's going to happen in practice is another story. But I think that there could be something we could learn here in terms of defining what is the most sensitive kind of data. Um, and Mr. Sherman and, and Ms. Gray have mentioned loca location data, for example. Uh, President Biden put forward an executive order in June in which he called for creating a framework to assess what the security risks of transactions of involving American sensitive data um, should be restricted. And in that executive order, he said not all data has the same level of sensitivity. So I think one thing we can do is have a more thoughtful process following on that executive order around what kind of data is vital to national security and should be subject to higher protections, and what kind of data is less sensitive um, and should be subject to more international flow and sharing. Let me finish with this, Mr. Um, Sherman. Is there any sort of data that cannot be relinked? So, of course, we say we're going to have location data and we're going to use it for X, Y, and Z purpose. It'll be anonymized. It'll be delinked. This is very important. Um, maybe you just want to use it to establish crowd flows within a city for city planning, et cetera. But is there any data that cannot be relinked if you have a enough, if you have a robust enough data set by which to compare it to? As Ms. Gray mentioned, there is a difference between data with someone's name or social security number attached and data that does not have that attached. But at the end of the day, you can re-identify anything. Um, as you know, myself and others have now testified, there's so much data out there on Americans hoarded by different companies that it's all too easy to combine it to identify people by name. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to um, sign off now because I have to transition to come in for votes. But I thank all the witnesses for your testimony, uh, including uh, Senator Warren's um, witnesses, whom I did not ask questions of, but found your testimony uh, very interesting. And Madam Chair, I look forward to collaborating with you on future such events. And thank you.